Um, so yes, hi guys. Hi. First, first question: Did you get rain? Uh, we did. We did. Was it good, or was it not enough, or was it satisfactory? Well, for uh, on, on on my side, so Montagne de Reims, we got thirty millimeters this week, which is um, which is what we needed. But pretty much. And and in the sauce part, 22. So that's, uh, that's good. 22 millimeters. That's great. Um, yeah, we got, I don't know, in millimeters, but there were like three, three nights, actually, where it rained softly, but enough. So we're super happy. Um, so for, as an introduction, I just wanted to let everybody know that it's not exactly a blind date between Aurélien and Francois. They, <laughs> they know each other super well, they're friends. Um, they're part of, uh, they're drinking each other's wines. Um, they're part of the um, same group um, of, of grower champagnes called Les Artisans du Champagne. Um, which also includes uh, people like Fred Savard, like uh, Vilmar, like uh, Pierre Peters and others. And um, to us, they kind of share somewhat their, their aesthetic. What, what, what they like to us is in a similar sort of zone, which means it's not the oxidative side of the new wave of champagne. Um, they're, they're, they're very linear, very mineral, very fresh, and we'll talk about that, why that choice and um, why they like that, and we certainly love it. So first, if you could each introduce your domain briefly, that would be wonderful. Okay. Aurélien, go for it. Yes. So, um, I'm Aurélien, I'm the eighth generation of my family. Uh, who are based in Celsius. Uh, so the name of the domain is the name of my grandfather. Uh, he did uh, three little plots from uh, his father and his uncle. And, um, and uh, yeah, after that it's my father and now it's me. So we are still of Champagne, Côte des Bains region, um, the name of uh, um, the name of our soil is Kimmeridgen soil. Uh, in before the French Revolution, we was Burgundian, uh, and um, and yes, the domain start uh, the four third generation start with poly activities. Uh, the, my grand grandfather, my grand grand uncle, experiment champagne uh, before. Uh, or between the two world war and my grandfather Pierre uh, was uh, the first one to say okay now I'm focusing about making champagne and he created the domain so all the plot is located in Celsius uh, the aim of my grandfather was to select and to be precise in his village uh, so he start with this wedding gift three little plot three little terroir and now we have 20 plot 20 terroirs that my grandfather select uh, for a different personality in, uh, in Celsius. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the approach of the domain. Uh, very, very quite special uh, about this uh, identification of terroir, a little bit special about our grape repartition, uh, in, in a little bit special with our relation with Pinot Blanc. So that's... Uh, so that's pretty unusual because basically, you didn't have to expand the domain at all. Your father had done such a good job of selecting yes. great parcels. And we'll talk about what he planted in a minute um, when we look over the domain, but you basically can focus on a lot of other things than... Yeah, yeah they, they, they do a very good job, uh, my father and my grandfather, uh, especially about the repartition of the grapes. Uh, Côte de Bar is one of the most 
uh, one of the good place for Pinot Noir, and one of the most interesting because the soil is also different, more Burgundian. Uh, so Côte des Bar is 90% of Pinot Noir. And the thing is, uh, yes, one of the good points in one uh, situation, uh, which is brown clay, and uh, the, the, the little problem of Côte des Bar is we are too Pinot Noir, too much Pinot Noir. Uh, because we are also white soil, so the white soil is very good for Chardonnay and Pinot Blanc, and that's uh, what my grandfather is doing uh, when he, uh, with his father and and uh, and also my father too. Uh, they um, they put brown uh, red grapes on brown soil and white grapes on white soils, and not a lot of people uh, do that in Côte d'Ivoire. So we are that's uh, that's uh, they, they do a very good job uh, about the selection of the, of the grapes also about the exposition uh, my grandfather for example was the first can, one to put Chardonnay can I, can I interrupt you and talk about that in just one second after Francois when we have the maps in front of us and we see the two two expositions if you don't mind um, yeah, okay yes. but, but to summarize the grape thing you're you're the widest domain in in the old, right? <laughs> yes. If I, if I can uh, put it that I way. Fifty so. percent uh, so, yeah. white varieties, where exactly. where the the um, uh, the old is basically ninety percent Pinot. So that's uh, yeah, because our region was quite far uh, from uh, the the um, the original place or the place where the where the legislation is made, uh, it's France and Epernay. Uh, we was far, and uh, so when we, uh, a lot of uh, difference in terms of influence, a lot of people and vignerons uh, since 100 years old uh, went to Burgundy to learn wine, and, uh, and uh, we have our influence is a lot of Burgundian. And the thing is, uh, we are at 10 kilometers of the Burgundy border. The, the thing is, um, with a lot, a lot of different steps in, in the history of Côte des Bars, uh, we uh, uh, was a lot of influenced uh, uh, by the politician yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and the politics. And the thing is, um, Côte des Bars was, uh, uh, and the Pinot Noir uh, was, uh, a little bit an obligation for the vignon uh, and uh, the thing is uh, when you produce uh, you have mess you have maybe more uh, liberty uh, and that's why my father and uh, my grandfather and the previous generation uh, can keep more white and put more white grapes like Chardonnay and Pinot Blanc. Great. I'm going to turn to Francois um, Francois. So Francois is up here. We'll see it closer up here. Actually. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And yep. Uh, we'll see it closer um, uh, in just a minute with another map. So who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> well, because I have no nothing else to do tonight. Uh, <laughs> Glad you could join. <laughs> I, I was planning to go to the to the sea, but you know, obviously we can't. Um, but anyway, so first of all, I'm very glad to be here. And I was so desperate to have a glass of original. I'm just waiting for three days to get it. So thank you guys for the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I am Francois Huré, and um, I'm the um, winemaker from Champagne Uretraire, which is a much shorter history than Aurélien Gerbet. We are basically the second generation and we are pretty happy about it. I say we um, because I work with my brother, Pierre, um, who cannot join us tonight, but um, Pierre, we have, we try to have two brains, well, sometimes. So Pierre is the, um, the vineyard brain, he's dealing about all the vineyard work, and I deal about, yeah, that's the guy, um, just behind the grinning things. <laughs> and um, 
<coughs> is, is actually really good in the vineyard. He's got a great um, feeling, great sensation, and he's got a great um, observation skill about the vineyard. So he's, um, I'm fully confident about what he does and about his decisions. And I take care about all the winemaking and slightly more the export market of so what we do. Very briefly, I think that what really um, uh, describes us is where we are coming from, which is Lude, so the, the, the village where we are, which is located in Montagne de Reims. I've, and the great thing about it, this is the north facing slope. That's point number one. And I think the second point that really, uh, really yeah, describes us is we want to show you guys that Champagne is all about wine. And Champagne has to have a strong identity and Champagne has to show where the fruit is growing. That's really what, what, um, what we believe in and what drives us every day. Cool. Um, so let's jump in and look at the terroirs a little closer. I'll start with um, Aurelien again. I guess that's the order of the evening. Thanks for wearing the t-shirt. Hi, Peter. Hi. Ilias, hi, the whole team basically, and everybody else. Um, so let me do this. And nope, not there. Okay. Give me one second. Or one day I'll get good at using this. Here we go. And here we go. Okay. Okay, so we I'm showing you this quickly. Um, this is Bonn, this is Paris, this is Reims, Troyes, which is the largest city um, close to the Aube. And here's Celle sur Ours, which is where Aurélien is located. And <coughs> the Aube, Chablis, and Sancerre are all part of the same geological formation, which is called the Kimmeridgian chain. So basically very, very different soil types from, and, and bedrock from, um, from the north. And, um, Kimmer and Kimmeridgian is both the name of the stage um, in the Jurassic and the name of uh, one type of limestone, or actually a marl, uh, described as a chalky marl, even if it's not a uh, chalk. And, um, but there's also Portlandian, same exact same configuration as Chablis. Um, and uh, very, very special because of that. It's entirely very, very different from the north. I'm sure you all know this, so let's go take a closer look at Celsius Ors. Here we go. That's the village. Just for reference, you have another little village called Polizo here. That's where Marie Courtin is, for example. And behind Celsius Urs, there is a valley which has very specific expositions. And I will let Aurélien. One is called L'Endroit and it faces south. The other one is called L'Envers and it faces north. Aurélien, tell us why this is special yeah. and also a special part of your family's history. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, Celle sur Ours is a, a part of the, of the Côte des Bains. Côte des Bains is two big, oh, two cities, Bar sur Aube and Bar sur Seine. We are more close to Bar sur Seine. Uh, so, Celle sur Ours, uh, it's difficult to see on the, this map, but Celle sur Ours is at the crossing of four different valleys. So maybe, Paul, if you can go a little bit back on the zoom, it's in, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna see that. Something which is very important because the, this, uh, this situation, crossing of Fort Valley is, uh, yeah, is completely, um, completely uh, impact the climate and especially uh, also this climate impact a lot uh, and uh, is one of the results uh, why we have a lot of Pinot Blanc in so let's, let's go over them. So this is the Valley of the Seine. Yeah, we'll go this in is, Paris. This is the Valley of the Ours River. Yeah. 
Exactly. This is the valley of the Aube. Of the Lars, Ville oh, sur Ars. Sorry. Where you can find Bertrand, Gautreau, uh, uh, Jean Quessens, uh, so this, this kind of domain. And after, you have another valley, uh, a little bit down, uh, and this valley go to Lerisse. So this crossing oh, of four valleys is very... This other side, yeah. so here. Down, yeah. yeah, down, yeah, a little bit down. Okay. And um, this, this valley, uh, this situation of Celsius was uh, uh, quite a lot of problematic 100 years ago because the vigneron maybe uh, can produce uh, one vintage every 10 vintage. So can harvest one year every 10 year. Uh, because when you are at the crossing of valley, you have a lot of humidity and you have also a lot of, of uh, uh, exposition to the spring frost. So one of the first solutions they find to fight against the frost was to using Pinot Blanc because the debudding of Pinot Blanc was later uh, than Pinot Noir or the other grapes. So Celsius is, if it's something special in Celsius is that, uh, crossing of valley, different, a lot of exposition, uh, different exposition, so we, and, uh, and, um, and this uh, affinity uh, with uh, Pinot Blanc. It's basically uh, the capital of Pinot Blanc in Champagne. Yes, if you if you if you're looking about Champagne, uh, ninety nine point seven percent is divided by three between Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Zero point three percent is for the grapes, uh, so we can use seven grapes in Champagne, and the for the grapes is Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Petit Melier, and Arban. And this for the grape, 0.3% is mostly Pinot Blanc, and this Pinot Blanc is mostly in Celsius. So if you look at uh, the terroir of Leproix, just on the left, uh, Leproix uh, is uh, very close to the river. The river of Lourdes is on the forest, uh, just uh, down to, uh, uh, to Leproix. And the reason why they put uh, Pinot Blanc here uh, 100 years ago uh, was because you, the, the proximity of the, of the river. So, yes, uh, the Lourdes Valley is, uh, is two big expositions, Androis and Anvers, uh, Androis is south facing, uh, and um, is uh, where everybody wants to put vines uh, when they started, because in Champagne in the past we have a, a problem of maturity. Uh, now maybe we can uh, we have problem of over over ripeness uh, and uh, the thing is uh, Anvers uh, so the the north exposition uh, speak uh, now uh, better and better every year so I'm lucky because yes in our history my grandfather made the choice to put uh, our vineyard in half in Androis south facing and half. <laughs> In Anvers, north facing. So and, and it, yeah. it was pretty crazy to put Chardonnay there, especially right at that time. Or it was yes. it was not done. Yes, if you can go on Les Côtes, uh, maybe not on Saint Marie. Uh, the Les Côtes plot was uh, the uh, is um, a terroir uh, represent fifty percent of the cuvée osmose, and Les Côtes was Chardonnay uh, planted. Uh, for the first time in Celsius in the bad exposition, north facing. So when uh, you have um, the sun on your back, uh, you can have less exposition to the sun and you can burn less acidity and save uh, more acidity. So that's why the north facing uh, is starting very, very interesting. It's very important. For example, uh, uh, one of our cuvée Grand Cell, uh, when we mix all the terroir, all the different plots uh, in, in the same cuvée. Um, so yeah, the, the what, 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 Why did he do that? Did he sense global warming already? Did he... The, the, when, I, when I speak to him, it was a, a question about uh, um, another expression, the research of another expression. Uh, also, in the past, uh, the last warm vintage is not only 2003 or, 90, uh, or 99, it's also 
you have also some warm vintage in the past. So the reflection was, okay, let's try to find another terroir of Chardonnay. And it was a, a, a little bit risk at the beginning and uh, it take the risk and, and it's a, bit, a little piece of luck also. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, 50 years ago, it was difficult to, to see if it's a good choice or not. So now you can say, uh, we can say it's a good choice, but in the past, it was not very easy to say. That's your grandpa, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I would like you to um, tell us a little bit about um, the slope here, because first of all, it's quite steep. Um, let me go back a little. It's, I mean, it's, it's steep compared to, to the north. I mean, there are much more Burgundian slopes in a way. And you, you generally say that there's, you know, obviously more clay in the belly and the bottom. So yes. in, in general, you have Chardonnay up here. Yeah, and so, so yeah, when we decide uh, which grapes uh, we want to put for the new plots, we say we try to identify uh, to to see if it's brown clay or white clay. If okay. it's brown clay, it's gonna be red grapes, uh, mostly uh, Pinot Noir, uh, a little bit of Pinot Meunier for we taste a little bit to plant of Pinot Meunier. And uh, if it's white clay, uh, the the middle, the bottom to the middle will be Pinot Blanc, and uh, the middle to the top will be uh, Chardonnay. Because Chardonnay, yes, is more sensible to the frost and to the humidity. So Pinot Blanc down and Chardonnay up. So yeah, and it's it's it's, uh, it's our region look a little bit more like uh, Sancerre or Chablis, uh, and uh, the region of Francois is looking more like Bourgogne, like one coast. Uh, but uh, when you are in the hill and when you are in the steep, uh, it's exactly the same everywhere. Uh, in the bottom, you have the erosion and the sedimentation, so you can have you can have more steep, more deep soil, more clay, um, wine with more richness. Uh, the top part is always the the erosion part, so you can have uh, the the less uh, less soil, and uh, and the middle is uh, where the Grand Cru are in Burgundy, and uh, it's where you are the best mix between both and the oldest part of the soil. So it's the same in our place uh, and uh, in a lot of places. And much like Chablis, yes. you have both Portlandian and Kimmeridgian, right? Yes. So uh, yeah, 90% 90, 90 of, the, of the hill uh, is uh, Kimmeridgian and 10%, uh, the top part of the hill is Portlandian. So like Chablis, the Chablis, uh, Village, Grand Cru or First Cru is on Kimmeridgian and the Petit Chablis is on Portlandian. So it means um, the salty sensation and the salinity is more on the Kimmeridgian side. Uh, the Portlandian side uh, is, uh, uh, is 20 million years younger. So the acidity uh, is with more angle on the, on the, Portland, on the Portlandian. So can we talk about this for a second? The Pinot Blanc. Yes. You have, do you see the canes? Um, do you see the no, picture? I, I have nothing for the moment, but uh, I, I maybe I, I know what's, what it means. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's um, yeah, a plot. Uh, um, where we save Pinot Blanc since uh, gen generation after generation and uh, it's uh, uh, this, uh, um, this the plot, the most famous of the domain, it's called Les Proies. it was grafted and, uh, in, into the phylloxera in, grafted in 1904 on Ruggieri rootstock and um, we still keep it and it's a piece of our history in the domain and a piece also a little bit of history of Champagne because it's maybe the oldest part of Pinot Blanc in Champagne. So it's also the, 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 yeah, the, the memories of uh, massal selection and of uh, 
identity of, uh, of uh, diversity of grapes and of uh, personality of plants. Yeah. And you're 25, yeah, but, you have 25%. So that's plan, that was planted in 1904, right? I'm sorry if you were saying that. I, uh, I, 1904. 1904, that's incredible. And um, if, if I may, if I may. Yes, you may. Aurélien will, will never say it, but this is the best Pinot Blanc vineyard in Champagne. All right. Thanks, Francois. I, uh, I, you, yeah, Estelle Suros is a very good place for Pinot Blanc, and uh, Pinot Blanc is uh, is one of the best places, Estelle Suros for sure, for Pinot Blanc. But uh, maybe Pinot Blanc can play in a different uh, part of Champagne. The problem with these grapes is uh, the a lot of people in the past uh, never want to understand it. Uh, they never pick in the good time, so uh, Pinot Blanc can, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's about climate change and balance about Pinot Blanc, but Pinot Blanc is also uh, a piece of, uh, uh, of interest and of uh, future of Champagne, and, and Champagne is not, can, can also uh, be made with some other grapes and good one. I'm going to ask... Um... I'm going to ask uh, Francois to present his terroir, but basically, so we can get to the wines. <coughs> but of course, you have the Côte des Blancs, you have the Vallée de la Marne, you have the mountain of Reims, the Petite Montagne de Reims, the Massif de Saint-Thierry, and the northern mountain of Reims is here. And that is what we are going to take a look at. Uh, yeah, basically, if, if you just leave that map for a sec, oh, Paul, I, I will, um, I will just back. for the people who don't really know, well, if you, when you are in Lude, Reims is fully north of Lude, and Epernay is completely south. All right, so it really gives you the perfect explanation why Lude and Verzenay and May Champagne that are really close to each other are like the complete opposite um, um, exposition, exposure to the sun than Guzzi or Ai or Maroy sur Ai or Cumière, for example. It's like right on the other side of the hill. Okay, so let's go take a look at it. So you're in this sector here. Uh, Lud, yeah. And so obviously we're on very different soil. We're on chalk and the topsoil plays a huge importance there. Um, it's, it's younger limestone than um, the Côte de Bar has from the-, um, the It the is. It's, from it is, it's younger and this is also softer. We are pretty, pretty soft kind of people in Montagne de Reims, <laughs> and uh, we are, <laughs> we have uh, usually soft kind of joke. <laughs> but um, it, you're right. It's globally what we call, you know, clay and limestone soil. So, um, but the the big difference of Lude and Chine les Roses that are really close, kind of of, of soils together, those two villages is the, the, the content of sand in the, in the clay, on the topsoil. Like in Lude, we have up to 50% of sand mixed with the clay, especially in, in our vineyards uh, La Perte, the Pinot Noir La Perte, um, which if, if you look at the soil, this is very friable, it's very soft, and this is also mm. very free draining kind of soils. And we have this, this, this layer of, of sandy clay. I think you guys call it loam, I guess. Um, um, this, this layer is up to 40, 45 centimeters thick. And then we have a very soft kind of choke mixed with a little bit of, of, of clay and sand for, for two, two meters. And then the deeper we go, the whiter is the choke and the, the harder it's getting. So right. let me ask you a geeky question. Um, I've read that there's two kinds of chalk in Champagne, the Bellumnite chalk and the Microcaster chalk. Is that yep. something that is relevant or not at all? 
it's relevant for the very geek kind of people, I <laughs> guess. <laughs> uh, and um, it's, well, the, besides the names, I think it's what really matters is the aspect of the truth. And it's, it's a very easy um, to see the difference between Lude and May Champagne, for example. Uh, I live in May, uh, and, um, and the chalk in May is fully white, and it's very hard. You know, really, this is really big blocks of chalk. In Lude, the chalk we have is slightly more brown, and we don't get that big blocks. We got, you know, smaller blocks, and it's slightly softer. And it really explains exactly what you were saying. The two chokes come from the two uh, names you were explaining just before. And usually, if, if you even go south to Côte des Blancs, we, we don't really want to talk about Côte des Blancs because they don't really need us, but, but uh, the, um, the, the, the choke that you can get in Le Menil or Avis or Cramont is also very white and, and very, in very kind of big, big blocks. Um, but coming back to the general uh, question is, um, compared to what Aurélien was saying, the other big difference is we have this, this clay on the topsoil mixed with the sand. So if we go um, close to the forest, which is on the bottom of the screen right now, we got a, a quite um, a, a layer of clay, which would be around, you know, 30, 35 centimeters. And the further we go down the hill, so we were going towards Reims or towards the vineyards called La Grosse Pierre on the map, we have um, on the middle of the hill um, a layer of choke, sorry, of clay and sand mixed together, 35 to 50 centimeters max. That's where we got a very elegant, very delicate, very uplifted style of, of, um, of wines. And <clears throat> if we go um, downhill, like nearly on, on the flat land, we have slightly more clay and less sand. So which, as, as Aurelien was just saying before, we get a very generous, very um, fruit driven, very easy drinking style of wine. Probably not with the, with the highest aging potential, but very fruity, very charming style. So, Except, yep, yeah. yep. So this is, so when I was in the Côte de Blanc a few years ago, I was stunned because a few winemakers there told me that their better parcels were actually on the bottom slope because there was less topsoil. In exactly. The, in the Côte de Blanc. But, but you're more like, what you're saying is that you're more like Burgundy in a way. You could, well, I, 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 I'm not finished. Ah. Uh, I was not finished. Um, but you're right. In, in Côte de Blanc, you know, if you go uh, Les Hautes, or the Zalouette or the Chetillon, this is flat land, you know, and this is, uh, and, and there is no hill, but this is pure free draining soil. In Montagne de Reims, where we are, we have, um, as I was explaining, um, um, more clay on the bottom soil, except one situation. One, um, in this situation is where La Grosse Pierre is. So if, if you can point La Grosse Pierre, yeah, on just on the left here. The, we don't really see it from here, but La Grosse Pierre, there is, this is not exactly flat. There is a very, very tiny hill where all the clay has been, oh, has been washed off. And mm. we call this small hill une dorsale. Okay. And we see, we see this, this dorsale. So basically, you know, the, the clay goes down a hill, and then we have a bit of flat land and just a tiny hill here, right there, where the clay has been washed off by wind and rain, and we are nearly right close to the limestone. So, for example, in La Grosse Pierre, we have 15 centimeters of clay, and then we are right on the chalk. Okay. And, and, the, and, and that's a great kind of terroir. <coughs> Is the high percentage of sand one of the reasons why Lourdes is, is kind of also famous for Pinot Meunier or not? Absolutely, absolutely. I think 
um, back in the 90s, lead was planted with 65% Meunier. Hmm. 65, two thirds of the vineyards. It has changed um, a little bit over the last 20, 25 years. So we see slightly more Chardonnay, but this is definitely not for the wine. This is just for the money because all the people who are selling, all the growers who are not making wine, but, but selling grapes to the big houses, they basically got more money if they sell um, Chardonnay grapes, mm. like an extra, I don't know, 20 cents or whatever. Um, so all those guys who don't really care about wine, you know, they, they, they plant um, Chardonnay to get more money. But I think the real identity of Lud is, is definitely Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir. And I think nowadays the breakdown is around 52% of Meunier planted, around, um, around 30, 35% of Pinot Noir and, and the rest as, as a Chardonnay grapes. So that's why you have to go to Rilly La Montagne for Chardonnay. Yeah, well, Rilly La Montagne is slightly different, especially this vineyard that you are showing, Les Blanchevois because Les Blanchevois is one of the only vineyards which is for us a south facing vineyard. You know, basically we go here, yeah. downhill, this is all the Montagne de Reims, flat land, and then Les Blanchevois is just another hill and Les Blanchevois is just right there, facing south. Facing south and Les Blanchevois, you, sorry? No, it's another hill that's, it's an outcrop, say, uh, it's a yeah, exactly. resurgence of the limestone, and and the hill faces south, yes. And, and as you were showing on the map, you can see that Les Blanchevois, it, it literally means the white tracks, basically, or white, um, white road. And there is no clay there. This is, uh, all, all the clay has been washed off again, and this is pure chalk. Um, and, and if you can come back to the previous page where you are showing the Blanchevois, you see how white the soil is there, you know. Just right. and, and we like that vineyard because I think Chardonnay always has more precision, more expression, more um, um, yeah, more uh, very elegant bitterness on the finish when it grows on um, on pure chalk. Mm. That's why we like vineyards as a vineyard, and I think it really carry on a, a strong identity. Um, and um... It's a vineyard that people may not know they're familiar with, but they, you know, people who, who do like champagne uh, probably know it a little because it's, it's plays an important role in, in, in one of the people that's in your group in Villemar. Yeah, yeah. Basically, the, the story of uh, Blanchevoix has started um, in the 60s. Before the 60s, it was, you know, just for um, um, cereal or just for, you know, uh, paddocks for for, um, for the farms, but it was not planted. So they started to plant that in the in the 60s, and it was basically divided by three families: the Vilmar family, who's got the biggest place, and two other family in in Rue la Montagne. And when they started to plant that vineyard, this place in the 60s, people were like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, this, this is, there is nothing special there. This is very, um, very poor kind of soil. What are you going to grow there? People were always looking for more clay, thicker kind of soil, um, but they planted it. And, and the wines coming out of those vineyards, you know, with, with time and experience is actually the best part that you can find in Rio de la Montagne. And, and, you know, Laurent Champ from, from Villemar, I think they have a little bit more than five hectares there, which is half of the domain in the Longevoix. But really define a very strong and classic style. Cool. Let's, time flies. Uh, I love talking about terroirs, my favorite subject, but let's get into the wines for a bit. Aurénia. You're drinking a François Huret mm. wine. You want to tell us how he makes it? No, I'm kidding. Um, Not yet. <laughs> I'm drinking uh, Lodas. Yes. 12. I'm drinking L'Original 15. 
And from last night, which I popped with Raj, I had the Coteau Champenois, which is also the Pinot Blanc, um, 2018. But um, just you guys make wines, as I said, that are that are like buddies make wine. They're very similar, but you you get there with entirely different methods, actually. So yeah. uh, the the um, to start with something is when we make wine and when when we don't speak about wine making uh, i always say think uh, i'm in the different situation uh, and we are in completely different situations so uh, what we are looking uh, maybe something which is uh, the same philosophy than francois is uh, freshness precision capacity to age uh, something very a research of purity and uh, and a lot of complexity. So the thing is uh, between Francois and I, uh, what we we looking for the same, but sometimes the way or the direction is not the same. For example, for us, we only use tank. Um, uh, and for example, uh, I only do mallow. So when I drink a little bit of very, uh, one of the greatest Pinot Meunier in Champagne, it's uh, no mallow in barrel. So something which is the start of something and the reflection. So what I'm looking for, I'm in so part of Champagne, between one or two weeks riper than the north, have a soil more um, more hard with a, a very difficult situation to work. The, so the shocky soil is very good to catch water and to keep water and uh, it means um, you can have uh, also different um, energy or direction. I always say I'm not sure about that. Uh, I, I don't. I never speak about that. But with Francois, but uh, I think that's in South part of Champagne because our soil is dry and harder, uh, twice older. Uh, the we can we have impact first about the climate. So in Côte de Bar, you can feel more richness and more generosity first. And uh, uh, what we're looking for in the domain, why we lose, why we use a massal selection is to have deeper roots and to have the capacity to keep uh, the vines longer as we can. And when you do that, you're gonna have the finish that we want is this salty and salinity sensation. So I always say the sauce part of Champagne Côte de Bar start large and finish tight. Um, Sometimes when you, because it's riper for us, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the approach. And sometimes in the north, I feel that the wine is starting tight uh, because the clay can give uh, the water when the vines need it during the season and after with, with some aging with uh, some uh, um, also bottle aging uh, the wine finish more large and uh, open a little so it's two kind of uh, dynamic of wine Sh uh, our wine in Côte de Bar start large and finish tight and it's a bit the inverse uh, my sensation is a bit the inverse about the north dynamic so when, when uh, you um, and, and um. you will say you, yeah, you will tell me after. But what's what's uh, what I'm looking for is to keep the freshness in the one of the riper place in Champagne. So, so I using I picking. I'm probably the first to pick uh, okay. in the village. Uh, what, uh, so always, are you are you looking for um, a specific maturity or I'm I'm looking for the best combination between acidity and and maturity and to be honest with you when I was speaking about uh, people for example from uh, I was I remember a discussion with Pascal Agrappa 
before the harvest and uh, I asked to Pascal uh, what is your acidity uh, what's, you know, what's your, what did you have in, your, in terms of facility? And Pascal told me, we never care, I don't know, we never care about acidity, we always care about maturity. For us, it's the inverse. Mm. We know that we have always the maturity, but our problem is uh, to save the acidity. So, so the climate change impact a lot, uh, this, uh, this situation in Côte d'Ebar. And uh, and what we what is what is our choice? Our choice was to work with old vines. When you have old vines, you have deeper roots, and deeper roots means you are a bit less sensible to the temperature of the soil, to the dryness of the soil, and you have also maybe a capacity to catch water and to have less stress uh, when you have uh, old vines. So I think this different step of solution help us to save acidity. Mm. So what I'm doing for winemaking is that uh, try to save the most freshness that I can because for me freshness and the good balance between richness and freshness is always uh, the best solution for making great wine and great wine is uh, one with the better balance. And, uh, and the, the thing is, I'm in warmer climate, so I'm using, I using tank to keep this uh, precision and freshness. Uh, I'm using mallow because I think mallow in Kimmeridgen soil uh, is always a better solution. Uh, and uh, I try uh, to work hard on the vineyard to save more acidity with all our decisions, especially uh, when, when, we, when we work like uh, plunging, when we work like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, when we play with the quantity of leaf photosynthesis, uh, we can impact uh, the capacity uh, to catch acidity. So that's, um, that's, I prefer to work before the harvest to save acidity. And, uh, and to do the mallow after, because for me, in Côte de Bar, the complexity uh, is better for wine who are making mallow lactic. So everything under the Pierre Gerbet label is stainless. Everything goes through mallow. Recently, yes. recently, you've actually invested in smaller tanks so you can really vinify even more parcel by parcel. Yeah. In 2010, my father built a cellar with 20 tanks for the 20 different terroirs, 20 plots. And last year, so 2010, before, we can do single plot winemaking. Now we can do micro winemaking. It means sometimes in one plot you have the top part of the bottom or the left part which is always better. So now we can uh, we can step back so that's, uh, that's another uh, um, another details you know great wine good the good wine and, and the great wine what is the difference is details so that's uh, more put more details be more precise with uh, our personality of terroir. And so you started making completely sans sulfur champagne in 10, 2010 or 11 or 9 or what was the first vintage of Vildas? It was 10. Uh, 10 was, was my second harvest uh, in the domain. Uh, when I arrive, uh, we have uh, a champagne where we mix the cuvee, uh, so now it's Grand Sel. Uh, we have 100% Chardonnay. Uh, the name was Prestige before, now it's called Losmos, and uh, we had l'original. And I asked my cousin, and my so we are in Côte des Bar, one of the good places in Pinot Noir, for Pinot Noir and Champagne, and we don't have Blanc de Noir. And, uh, and I asked to my father and my grandfather, so can we taste something? Can we, uh, we maybe uh, think about making Blanc de Noir? And uh, my father and grandfathers um, and I uh, take the decision to make a, 
qui ne perceive with not on the fruity side, not on the accessible side, but more on the serious side, more a champagne to eat with. And when we start, we do uh, the power of Saint Marie. Uh, we uh, do a lot of experimentation uh, about it, and we start. And one of this one of these experimentation was uh, made with no sulfites. And uh, and uh, and uh, and yes, uh, we always pref when when we start. Uh, we start with uh, wine making like the white. And the problem is when we add a little bit of sulfite in the press, uh, during the pressing, we completely lose uh, the fruit and the access and the, the, the richness and the, and the, and the, um, yeah, this creamy sensation and richness sensation. And uh, we research where we lose it. And it was at the beginning. So that's why we try to play with no sulfite. Okay. So, yeah. I'm going to take it to Francois for a bit. Yep. Um, so, you, yep. you, um, <laughs> you do things a different way. Um, you've got stainless, you've got barrels, you've got food. I don't. I don't really hear you, Paul. Can, can you repeat? Yes. No. You. You. You do a lot of things in a different manner. You have stainless. You have food. You have barrels. You have a lot of no no mallow. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the main point is to to come back to what Aurélien was was saying um, the general style. Uh, is comes from. Um, I mean, I was explaining just before that we like that champagne has to show where it's coming from, and we are north facing slope, lots of black grapes, so our wine has to show this cooler climate and this richness coming from the black fruit. But I think it's also if, even if, as a winemaker, if you try to respect the soil and to express it in your wine, there is always your vision through it and you know that's why i think we cannot disconnect how it's located and the people who are working there you know the the impact of of the human working there you know has is 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 very intense where wherever you are in burgundy in champagne or in Loire valley and i have to say that when I was working a few years ago at, um, at De Montigny, uh, I was still there. Uh, that was back in 99 and 2000. Mm. And at Uber, um, we were talking one night together, and it was like, you know, Francois, moi, j'aime les vins comme ça. Yes. Les vins qui sont comme ça, j'aime pas. Uh, and, and like I think linear, this, linear wines, straight yeah. wines, and not fat and round wines. Basically. And and this this is something that I didn't really understood. I think I was twenty, um, and this this was something that I didn't really un understand back then. But the more I went through wines, the more I went through different regional countries, the more I understood what he was saying. And this is something that I feel completely okay with today, it completely like in the same direction. So I like champagne or I like, like wine when they give you like a very vertical aspect, very vertical testing with a very um, um, strict backbone. And I don't like wine that you know, gives you everything from day one and after 20 seconds it's all gone. And, and I think we have the chance in, in Lude, in this snow-facing slope, to you know, express quite easily this style of champagne. I, I a, a, can I just stop you one second? Because the north-facing thing um, is important. Uh, and um, there was an interesting question earlier on that I, I didn't have a precise answer to. So why was champagne planted? There's a specific reason why Champagne was planted also on north-facing sites centuries ago, before global warming, 
and that the wines were considered good, whereas in most other places in France, it would have not been considered a good exposition. Is there a specific microclimate or something that's happening? Well, allow the we, we, have to, we have to think champagne, you know, so we, we are specifically where we are, you know, Verzenay, Maillet Champagne, Lude, Rie la Montagne, all those villages, we have to think champagne. And we have to think that um, back in the days, the people who made champagne were, for most of them, you know, big houses. And the big houses were looking for blended style of champagne. Mm. And, and having Pinot Noir or Meunier in the north facing slope was always a way to get freshness. And get the wines. Um, and, and that's why and we have, we are able to grow fruit on the north facing slope. And once again, we're in Champagne, so we're not looking for the kind of maturity that people are looking in Burgundy or, or Rhone Valley or Loire Valley. You know, we, we try to pick our fruit at, at my winery around, I would say, 19, 20 bricks max. You know, when we go above 20 bricks, we know that we are losing, um, this uplifted character that we like. That's why we, go, we, we, we can grow fruit on a north facing slope in Champagne. But does it make sense to you? Yeah, no, no, I just read things like there was a special microclimate where the warm air came back down and other people say the chalk reflects the heat and you know, that's why you're able to even, you know, be a serious wine grower. It, it, it's, it's true that the chalk reflects the heat, but we have clay above it. So except right. in the Blanchois, where we have you know, chalk right on the top soil, for the other vineyards, there is no really um, reflect impact right now. Okay, thanks. I, let's get back to winemaking. I was just... So yeah, back to winemaking. And, and uh, there is something that Aurelien said, which is completely true. Um, with my brother, we are, we, we are just looking less and less to numbers and we are just looking or trusting more and more what we feel before each harvest. And we need to consider that the, the picking dead decision doesn't, um, doesn't, we, we have to, to put ourselves in perspective to the vintage. <clears throat> and the vintage is not the last two weeks before harvest. The vintage starts when the bud break starts. So basically, when um, from like two weeks ago until September, we need to think about that, about the global climate, the testing year, hot year, any year, and then the, the picking decision is just the matter of balance. How can we handle the balance we like within the climate, within the vintage that we have? And that, I think that's the very, um, strong decision of the winemaker, being able to put yourself in perspective and see with the climatic condition of the year, when do I need to pick without looking at numbers? I think that really, uh, that really matters. And then in terms of winemaking, um, yes, we are quite different from Aurelien, but I think the goal is the same. We like freshness, we like wine with a, with a great um, phenolic maturity and a great phenolic presence in the, in the planet but um, I prefer no matter wine so just to be clear we used to be full malolactic um, 12 years ago um, and we, with my brother basically what we have changed in the viticulture in, with, with you know no more herbicides or lower crop we basically pick nowadays riper fruit than before and with riper fruits, I think uh, I, don't think, I don't think mallow. I don't think this is a matter of freshness or not. I like no mallow wines because I like the precision of the flavor. I like the precision of the balance in the um, in the um, in, when you taste the wines. It's more about you know showing that direction rather than being just focused on acidity. I think, and, and I think Pascal Agrappa is the best example. You know, Pascal Agrappa is full mellow and his wines are just so fresh. You know, yeah. Every single year. So for me, 
if we pick riper fruit, we can go no mallow because it helps me to go with a with a slightly yeah more precision and more details. In different Aurelien is we, we do have you know stainless steel tanks um, for for part of our wines, but roughly we have depending on the year, but thirty five to four percent wine at my place and bigger size barrels. So we go 600 liter barrels, 350 liter barrels, because I think it's, th those two sizes are perfect to, to keep the identity of each vineyard, to keep the energy, you need a good vibration that we can have in different vineyards um, without bringing too much uh, oak or too much wood character. But I think, with the, the, the pH and the acidity that we have in, in our vineyards, giving a touch of, you know, aging, barrel aging, um, but we, we never go through any lee stirring. We, we don't know, we are too lazy for this. So there is, um, there is just, you know, topping barrels every, every 10 days, basically. But I like the texture that the, the, the oak um, can you know balance the wine? You have this more creaminess and more silkiness. As so well. you you have wood wood on each cuvee, on which cuvées? Um, so we have wood in uh, Inattendu Blanc de Blanc, um, the Instantané Blanc de Noir, and Mémoire. Yeah, twelve. Um, and that, that's for the four elements for the for the Urefrère series and and for the single vineyard series the four elements this is all under 600 liter barrel. You, you remember they're not called four elements in the US oh, because, shit, yeah. because you almost got sued by Cordonu. Because I'm a big threat for Cordonu. You're a huge threat so you so what Aurelia was showing is the original name four elements but in the US it must be labeled this way 4V yeah. But it's it's the same thing, um, except you have to change the label for the U.S. And those are yeah. all vin vinified in demi weed. Yeah, yeah. And how the, do you the deal? Yeah, go for it. How do you block mallow? Um, two way to block mallow. Um, first of all, as as we don't go through mallow, the temperature of the cellar goes down quite quickly after ferment. After primary ferment, so I'm talking October, late October, we just like open the doors and the temperature goes down, and and that's one one of the one of the tool we use. The second tool is using a bit of sulfates. Um, I I do like very much sulfates, so we can we try to use as much as we can of it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, well, it's it's just. Um, at the press, basically, for all the vineyard that uh, we don't want to go through the minerality and surface right now. No, this is not something that we. <laughs> no, we're, we're yeah, we're going to talk about no, uh, no. It's um, but it's important. It's important for people to know because we're we're amongst geeks. But, but basically, uh, for the four element series, which is completely no matter with no filtration, we we going to be slightly under control with this. But we add at the press, if we want to go numbers, we add at the press between 55 to 60 parts per million or milligrams per liter is the same. And then if needed, we do a last addition in December, last correction in December. What I'm targeting basically um, is I want in the finished wine, a total of around 45 milligrams per liter total sulfur for okay. no metal and no filtration. Um, you have something special going on with a perpetual reserve versus a Solera. Yeah, yeah. So this is our, our wine called Memoir. Uh, I don't know if you have it, but I have it here. Um, here. Same label in both countries. Yes, <laughs> yes. We're, we're not a Matthias threat anymore. Uh, but, um, so memoir, it is uh, is a perpetual reserve of our reserve wine. So everybody knows what reserve wine is, but for those who don't know, reserve well, wines are all the wines coming from the previous vintages wait a that we keep either in tank or in barrels. But, 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 but. 
Your reserve, however, is a is a it's all blended, and yes, pe people. So people tend to call that a solera. It's more appropriate to call it a perpetual reserve. Um, right. Yes, yes, it, it is a perpetual reserve because everything is already blended in the same vessel, whether we, we're in tank or, or, or in, in oak cask or in barrels. We have decided to blend every single vintage since we started the Solera, and the Solera started for us in 1982 for the first year. So it goes all the way. I actually um, barreled down the 19 yesterday. So we have now in the in the big um, oak cask every single vintage from 82 up to 19 and the difference between a solera and, and a perpetual reserve is, um, is that in perpetual reserve everything is basically aged together all the vintages are aged together while in a solera uh, you can see um, all the um, you, ha you have the criaderas, which means that in each barrel you have a different vintage. And then you blend everything on the bottom barrel just before bottling. So that, that's a big difference. Perpetual reserve, everything is blended together, while in Solera you keep separate vintages. But, so the, but the difference, so I'm showing this picture if you see it, because over at the end behind Francois there are two large, large foudres. And that's where the wine called Memoir comes from. And the difference, yes. the difference between that perpetual reserve is that you fill it from the other perpetual reserve so it never gets more than a few percent of the young, youngest vintage in it. So it's one step closer to a true Solera, basically. Absolutely. You are, you're absolutely right. No, nothing I can add to that. But we have two, two perpetual reserves, the one in barrel that you just uh, pointed, and another one in tank, which is all our reserve wine that we use for, for our non-vintage champagne called um, Invitation. And I always, when, when I rack off what I need for memoir from the big barrels, I refill it, not with the last vintage, but with the perpetual reserve coming from the tank. And I did some calculation just to be sort of prepared for the interview tonight. And um, the, um, so 2019, which is the last vintage added yesterday, represent this year 13% of the big vowel. Mm. 13, one, three. Yeah. Yes, I'd seen some pretty, uh, I seen a post with some pretty incredible math on all that, but uh, thank you. Can you tell us, <laughs> I want to bring it back to Aurelia and I want to talk about Pinot Blanc some more and Conto Champenois, yep. but this tonight, last um, 12, uh, last Antane is screamingly good. Can you tell us about the cuvee? It's insane. It's been a few months since I tasted it and... Yeah. Oh, wow. So uh, instantané for us is is one of the wine. Um, this this is the, the main philosophy of this wine is to show you guys a vintage champagne and a vintage that we produce every single year, and which is not always usual in champagne. I think, or we think, with my brother, that the definition of a vintage is a wine that is giving you like a snapshot of the year and we think that every single year has a story to tell and this is our job as, as a winemaker to understand the story to really capture it and be able to explain it and to be able to do the selection of the wine in the winery that are the best reflect of the spirit of the year and this is this is really the philosophy behind Instantané, which is which is actually a blanc de noir, so roughly eighty percent pinot noir, twenty meunier, um, and and we like to age this wine slightly longer. So usually Instantané stays up to six seven years of of, um, of bottle aging before uh, before um, disgorgement, and <clears throat> and I like that concept of showing. The, the spirit, the philosophy, the picture of each vintage every year, which, which is what many people do around the world. And, and we like 12 very much in, um, in, in, on, on our side. I think this is a, a vintage with a great texture, fully ripe fruit, 
but a very sharp and dry finish um, coming from very super low pH. Basically, this one, the pH is, well, you don't, you really want to know about the pH? Yes. This is, this is 2.87. Wow. Okay. That's low. That's pretty low. Um, but, but I, Aurelien was talking about acidity before. We love acidity uh, as long as this is, you know, completely connected to the richness and the texture of the wine. So I'm going to take it to Aurelien. I want to talk about screaming acidity because I absolutely love it. Uh, before that, I've got one question for you uh, from Abe Schoner from um, Hi Abe. Um, about your graphic design and uh, what was the what was your thinking behind it? My to graphic it, design. Yes, your graphic design. Like, what's 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 your thinking behind? It's not graphic design. Oh, I, I don't know. I I don't I don't know. You know, I just pay people for this. You know. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, no, the, uh, the the deal with the the, um, the graphic design for memoir really. Uh, this this is what we call the Moebius trip. Which, which is like an infinite circle, you know, it never ends. And we think that for a, a perpetual wither, you know, that, that made sense to, um, to have, you know, like a, a circle that never ends, basically. Okay. But, you know, I'm, I'm not the marketing guy here. That's already on the marketing guy. <laughs> Yes, Thanks, he, my he, he's, he's, he's great. <laughs> he's, he's, he's great on Instagram. Not um, Aurelien, so first of all, this is beautiful. Um, it's your Coteau Champenois Pinot Blanc 2018. Um, you've been making Coteau Champenois for a while, and um, one, one day we'll, we'll get to taste the world, we'll get to taste your. Uh, your vast collection of Coteau Champenois, but um, so this is uh, same same parcel 19, uh, 1904. Yeah. It's it's yeah. incredible. It's really 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 um, showcases acidity. In in um, I mean I'm not going to be scared to use the word because I like that. It's violent. It's so powerful. It wakes you up. It's crazy in a really good way. It softens the next day. But I love that energy and that violence it has in it. What's the P first of all, what's the pH on that wine? And does it have anything to do with pH? This kind of the coteau? Yeah. Uh, the, the coteau is uh, 3.22 or something like that. It's interesting. That's so, so then it's the variety that's just giving some, I mean, blind, I don't know what I would call this. Um, yes, and, it, and it's also something a little bit not legal. Uh, I'll speak about uh, the little maceration part. Uh, we can't make uh, maceration in Champagne. So the Coteau Champagne that you have in your hand is our first uh, white wine in the domain. We historically made uh, Coteau Champagne red uh, in, in, in the domain uh, and in our region, you know, uh, we was producing a lot of Coteau Champenois in the past uh, and uh, before we made Champagne in our region we was made uh, we made Coteau Champenois red uh, and uh, you know our little history with Gamay in the past so we historically made red wine uh, mostly and uh, historically from Pinot Noir and uh, in 2018 uh, I would decide to try to make a white wine and not from Chardonnay but from Pinot Blanc because I always think that it's our job because uh, with our history and with our relation with Pinot Blanc it's our job to show to the people the, a different kind of expression of Pinot Blanc so my uh, my decision was to take the plot, uh, the oldest plot uh, of Pinot Blanc, the plot of l'original, uh, do a little um, um, maceration on the press. Uh, I crush it uh, for one third 
so on and the two third, I fold the press for the two third, uh, the rest of the press. I, I wait for a night uh, in the press and the morning uh, I, pu I press the button, uh, push the button and uh, this little mm, skin maceration, uh, it was, uh, I'm not a big fan about maceration whites, uh, but for Pinot, because it's Pinot Blanc, um, I don't think Chardonnay is a good grape for that, but for Pinot Blanc, because the complexity is also on the skin, uh, the Pinot Blanc can uh, be very interesting in the different expression uh, with a little bit of maceration. So this 2018 Coteau Champenot White is a Pinot Blanc uh, with crush by feet for one, for one third, uh, macerate during the night and press uh, the morning. And after it's uh, aging for 10 months, uh, in a tank, and uh, the yet yeah, um, the my my aim and my what I'm looking for was uh, another expression of Pinot Blanc. So yes, it's still Kimmeridgian, so it's still tight, still energic. Uh, it's Pinot Blanc, so it's peak uh, a little bit. Uh, the ripeness of the Coteau Champenois is I peak uh, one week after uh, the Champagne. Uh, um, and, base and, uh, and, uh, and yes, the maturity is, uh, uh, is higher and uh, the phenolic maturity is higher. So that's why uh, um, you can have another expression of Pinot Blanc. And you're a big believer in Pinot Blanc. I'm sorry I unshared this, but um, I'm sorry, big believer in Coteau Champenois. You're, you're standing in front of an uh, experimental vineyard um, which is, you have the authorization to do this, yeah. but basically it's illegal in Champagne. And you, you, you'd think you, you wouldn't want more maturity in Champagne, but you do for Coteau Champenois. Yes, the, 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 our obsession when we work and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you told me about my, uh, fancy vision of social media uh, <laughs> is uh, our, our job every day is the completely opposite of that. When I wake up the morning and when we wake up the morning, when we plant vines, it's for the next 80 years and it's for the next generation and the, and the generation after. So the, we are not thinking only 24 or 48 hours it's we're thinking about two next generations. So the problem with climate change, because it's a big question for us, for everybody, uh, but for us also, is what we plant, what we want, and what it's going to be in the future. And uh, the, the reflection of that picture is a reflection about Coteau Champenois. For me, Coteau Champenois is a piece of the answer, uh, one of the answers to fight against uh, the climate change. Maybe one day in Champagne, we have problem, we're going to have problem to save acidity and maybe it's going to be difficult to continue to make Champagne. So maybe one of the, one of the, the solution is to make steel wine. So maybe in Bourgogne, we're going to make Syrah, uh, maybe uh, uh, I, I think uh, after yeah. or, orange is the new black, champagne is the new burgundy. You know? Okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, so yes, the, 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 this picture is a little experimentation of what we're going to do if uh, vintage we can't save enough facility for making champagne. And uh, the, this question is, uh, the, the reflection is, I don't want to spend time making and experimentation time. I want the short time possible between making great champagne and great steel wine. So that's why I experiment now. And, uh, and yes, the objective is uh, to try to have more maturity for the Pinot Noir 
uh, uh, and and um, and and for the steel wine in general. So it's a question about canopy. It's a question about photosynthesis, quantity of leaf. It's a question about pruning system, goblet. Uh, uh, it's a question about um, yield. Uh, so that's uh, that's um, that's what a global reflection that we have because we what I'm planting now is for me first, but it's also for the next generation. So it, it means selection of different rootstock uh, with a late or early debudding, with massal selection early or late. Is this kind of little steps that we impact, that we can impact uh, of, in terms of decision to, to continue to make great wine and uh, I always say great wine, yes, it's a wine with the better balance. So the objective is to, to have the better balance for champagne or, and also for steel wine. Cool. Um, you don't want to talk at all about the secret project, right? But I, I can give you through, yeah, two, two words on it. Uh, when I, when I said to when I said to Francois and to you, I'm making wine on lean tank. It's because uh, it's because our philosophy of aging is not so long. Uh, with Pierre Gerbet, our aging bottle is three years, and we want to send the fresh side with Pierre Gerbet. Uh, in 2009, when I come back to the domain, I asked my father. I was uh, in 2008 with Olivier Lamy in Saint Aubin, and uh, and uh, I asked to my father and my grandfather, can I have a little piece of land or vines and a little piece of the cellar to try to experiment and try to find me? I am agreed to continue the history of the generation and the domain, but uh, please let me the possibility to, to experiment. And, um, and it was nat natural for me to continue what I'm learning in Burgundy during five years in Bonn, uh, wine making in barrel, big barrels. Uh, the big difference between the two projects, Pierre Gerbet and the new one, is the aging. And, uh, and, uh, and it's also a little education to the wine. So the, 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 the objective is the same, making great wine, but uh, one is made is made for 20 and uh, and 30 years capacity to age and one is made for 40 or 50 years uh, capacity to age or more and um, and when we play with barrels and we are cork aging is because we try to educate our wine of the oxygen and uh, and that's uh, the better point to have a wine who can age a lot. So, so um, uh, it's difficult to do that for Pierre Jarbeck because it's not the same quantity. Uh, the secret project, uh, we speak about uh, 12 barrels. So it's easier to do like that. It's uh, 10 years uh, aging. In we bottom. want more. That's, uh, it's too late. We want more now. You yeah. need to tell us more. <laughs> You're fucked. We want more. <laughs> so that, uh, yeah. The secret project still uh, still aging, and it's good to take the time sometime. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so just to explain it a little more. There are wines he's been making. He started, yes, as he said in two thousand and nine, but really started systematically in two thousand and thirteen, um, and and we've been waiting every year, and every year it's been. But there's there's some very different wines coming out of Gerbe or another name, but anyway, so really, yeah, so it's yeah. all the same thing. And what's fascinating is the comparison between on the same plus what a wine without bubbles and a wine with bubbles can do. Um, aged in wood, yes, etc. And and there's starting to be quite a collection, and we taste them occasionally. Um, but it's very occasionally, very, very occasionally, very occasionally. Well, he <laughs> already has nice to me when I go there. Usually, <laughs> usually when I, I, I try one. Um, but anyway, I'd like to, th we, we could go on for a long time, but I think an hour 20 is great. 
And um, thank you so much. Um, I apologize, there were a few reception issues. It's internet in the countryside in France, um, but I think we, they're, they're, I hope they were limited. Um, thank you too, if you have anything to add. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I want to say that Zoom is great. Zoom is super right now, but I think I can talk for myself and Aurelien, but we can wait to be back and see real people yeah. with real eye contact yeah. and real drink uh, with people. So great right now, but we will be back on the street and, and uh, on the road to talk about our wines. Thank you, Aurelien, thank you. Talk to you Thanks soon. Everything. Thank you, everybody. Ciao, ciao, bye bye. Do you have any questions for sure? Yeah, thank you. No, I think everybody was pretty fascinated by we didn't have that many actually, but nobody nobody left, so I don't think they were bored. So <laughs> we, we will continue. We'll talk soon. Kisses. A bientôt. Bis. Ciao, ciao.